Gig Gab, episode 405 from Tuesday, November 28th, 2023. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napoma, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Kent? I'm well, thank you. I played a, I played a solo acoustic gig over the weekend that was very soul-filling. It was just I hadn't played for a while. Yeah. And I am reminded how, I, I'm reminded how much each of the different things I do is, scratches a different itch, you know? Yes. I, 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 yes. I, I, it, I think this is interesting. I think if we rewound nine years, it might have been me saying that with you asking me what I meant, I, like I, like you were doing the one thing nine years ago yeah. when we did this. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what is that? I I've never played a solo acoustic or a solo gig of of any kind other than you know I'm in somebody's living room. They have a guitar. No one else wants to play guitar. We're by the campfire. No one else wants to play guitar. So I I entertain for an hour, right? Like that. But that's low stakes, right? Like. That's me choosing to do that in the moment, not me booking it and showing up with an expectation of three hours of music or whatever. Yeah. So well, I'm, I'm like, I know you can't, well, you, maybe you can describe it. Like, can you think back to the, the first time you did that or, or, or just what the experience of playing a solo gig is, is like versus, versus a band gig? So that's a really interesting question. Cause when I started to do it, um, I was determined to use it as a way to kind of work on my performance chops, my singing chops, my singing and playing chops. And so to me, it was, um, I wasn't good enough at it yet to actually shape the environment. It was all about like an, an, an almost like an exercise for making me. It, making it through, checking boxes. Yeah. And, okay. you know, work it, working on my stuff, I guess. But, you know, now having done it for quite a while, it's it's fun because it really feels like an expression of art, you know. Mm. I play whatever songs I want. I read the room and you know, or or take a request or don't take a request as it suits the show. You know, I I think I've shared like my approach to it is I like to mix a lot of different guitar styles when I play. Some of it is you know, some of it is campfire strumming. Some of it is intricate finger picking stuff. Some of it is kind of hybrid. Some of it is rock and roll. And it's just fun to kind of craft a narrative over the course of a show and to try and go over. And that's really the the fun of it. I, and I don't sweat if I don't go over. Okay. You know, like, like at a restaurant gig, you know, people aren't there to listen to you. So can I get someone, people's attention? And if someone comes up afterwards, you know, I really enjoyed that, you know, and they picked out some nuance of something that I did, that's really rewarding to me. And then, you know, the like I talk about my coffee house gigs where it's a whole room facing me. I used to do those solo. Yeah. Um, and now I now I always carve out, even when I play with my small groups, I always have a little time where I can do anywhere from three songs to a half hour of solo material as well to just to I just love to do it so much. But interesting. It it's so it's, it's it, been a great journey. It's it's been that thing from like working on my chops and you know, learning how to perform and learning how to talk to a crowd and you know, learning about discipline of like finishing songs and learning songs to play. And, uh, but two, like now it's an expression of art to me and it's just really fun to like to do a show and to try and take people someplace. And, you know, it doesn't always work and they don't always go, Sure, <laughs> but the, the journey is the reward for me. It's just, it's always fun. Interesting. So is, was it, like terrifying in the beginning as you were staring down the barrel of those first few gigs, uh, you know, I don't remember being terrified. Okay. I remember, I remember being keenly aware of flubs Yeah, and learning the lessons of, no, I mean, it's just you. There's no place to hide. Right. So you got to pick, you got to pick material. You got to pick material that you can, that you can do uh, and, you know, commit to it. And, you know, not fill time, you, you know, you, you really, that was the lesson there. It wasn't about being terrified because even when you made a flub and if someone noticed, you know, 
the, the world didn't end. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You it, learned, it wasn't like it was your first performance ever. You, you knew how to deal with flubs uh, by the time you, you did this solo gig for the first time. Right. That makes sense. But okay. you know, the, the flubs feel a lot bigger when there's nothing else around covering the flub. Right. Yeah. And so it definitely made me a much more focused musician, you know, how to, how to, the goal is no flubs. And so, right. You know, right. 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 Yeah. 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 Do, yeah. do you think that, that the experience of doing that helped like translated back to your full band stuff where absolutely okay. made me a better performer. Really? Yeah. Made I me. Yeah. That. Made yeah. me. Yeah. All, all that stuff. It, it, it was, it was a great learning ground. It still is. I mean, you still learn stuff every time you do it. And, yeah. you know, again, it's about repertoire and what suits you and, you know, you can't back off of a mic when, you, when you're not <laughs> quite sure of a part when it's just you, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's all that type of stuff. So, it's, it is still, and it, it's great. It now feels like an expression of art, but you still learn something every time you do it. You learn something about yeah. sound, and you learn something about, you know, how to read a room and how to, how to entertain in a room. So, it's, it's great. And it, it helps the small band stuff. I think when I do the small band stuff, it's unexpected if I do three or four or five songs in that style, just something different, a little break from the onslaught of a, of a band thing. And, and again, even with the house rockers, it's made me a better player and a better bandmate and a better listener and a better entertainer. Yeah. I can totally see all of that. Are there, and, and I mean, this also happens at full band gigs and everything in between, but are those moments where you notice it feels like a grind, like you're not able to get the crowd in sync? Maybe also, you know, you're you're playing okay, but it's just you're not you're not in a in that flow state that that we all aspire to, right? Where everything's just going and it it's just butter. Those moments where it's not just butter, did those feel heavier than the not butter moments when at least you've got other people on stage with you to sort of shared crisis right you know yeah i no i wouldn't say it at all i would no, say okay. that's part of the learning is like what mm -hmm. what happens when it's not a good night what what am i going to do i got nowhere else to turn so i got to figure this out so the only thing is like there are times when if you know it's a little longer drive and you had a hard day and you know and sometimes it feels like a chore and you can't offload any of that yeah. sensibility to a bandmate and so you but you got it but even in that is a great lesson right like i think like those guys who do this truly for a living and are doing it you know five six seven days a week and have to do it through colds and have to do it through you know relationship issues or whatever it might be yeah, kid, whatever it kids yeah. were bad grades you just really how hard it is to i mean maybe for some people it's a respite and you you can just lock that stuff out for a while or for other people. It's, it's, that's part of the deal. It's part of what makes a pro a pro is like compartmentalizing the stuff that's getting in the way of you getting a job done and getting a job done. Yep. Yeah. It, it totally, totally makes sense. I, I remember seeing uh, Arlo Guthrie at the, this local park Prescott park down in Portsmouth, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And it was just him. And obviously not his first time doing a solo show, right? Like yeah. this is, this is what he, even at that point in time, had been doing for decades, you know? Uh, and I remember watching at the end, you know, he put on a fantastic show as he always does. And at the end of the show, you know, he said goodnight or whatever. And he walked off stage. And then as we were like packing up our blanket and, you know, collecting the kids, kids were younger or whatever at that point. Uh, I look back on stage and there's Arlo, like, you know, taking his vocal mics off the stands yeah. and stuff. And it's like, oh yeah, he's just going to get in his car and drive the two hours home after this. He's not staying in Portsmouth tonight either. He's going to, well, you know, he's going to GTFO. Yeah. It is, it is a work, but it, you yeah. know, it is a super interesting artistic expression. Yeah. And all, I think back about it, all, all of my favorite musicians have this in their bag. Like, not, like I love singer, sorry, like James Taylor, yeah. singer songwriters who kind of do this for a living is and do this as their main jig. But you know, when, uh, when, when rockers do an unplugged set or an, an, an unexpected version of some of their songs unplugged MTV unplugged was, you know, pretty mind blowing to me. Right. That, yeah. that whole format was just 
so interesting to take these songs that have one style, one life, and hear them reinterpreted in another way. That stuff always turned me on. So, so it's just I just find it a really pure form of expression and, and art. So it's just a lot of fun to do. Ah, fascinating. I I think it's yeah, it's great. I don't I don't know that I will ever experience that like in that i i don't you and i have done duos right oh, you and I've, i have done yes. fairly naked stuff right and you I've do done, your you do monkey fist and absolutely I, i've done you know duos is as as naked as it's gotten and 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 a duo is way more naked than a trio in for me a, a trio yeah. feels like a band if you will right and, and not that a duo isn't a band i mean we can you know split hairs but but in terms of the the feel of it the monkey fist thing when we play as a trio, it it, it has a similar vibe to a band. Um, whereas when I've done duos with you or, or, or you know when John and I were doing monkey fist duos or I've did duos with Amanda forever, those it, it's a different vibe. It it's like oh it's a lot more naked than when there's three people there. I don't know why that yeah. is, but but that that it's palpable every time, not just the first time. You, you know. If you, each time feels like the first time. Would you ever do it? Would like just to see if you could? Would you ever, in a monkey fist type thing? Would you ever say, "Hey, I'm going to do a solo one"? You know, oh. could you play enough guitar? You could get through yeah. something, right? Oh, I, I that happens all the time. Well, I mean, not every gig, but but yes, it it happens. We played a gig a couple of a, I don't know a couple of months ago where it was this smoky place. Actually, we just played there the other night, and I have some things to share about that. But it was the we I don't know whenever we played there for the third set, John's voice was shot. And we just thought it was the smoke. We found out a couple of days later he had strep throat. He, he didn't know either. Like otherwise he wouldn't have shown up for the gig, obviously. But um, so yeah, I did three or four songs in the third set. But how did you enjoy it? Oh, it's fine. I, I like I said, I'm I'm used to it when it's on my terms, right? And it was like, oh yeah, I can do this. But you know, we were already through two sets. We already had the crowd in the palms of our hands. We could do no wrong. I, you know, there was it. It wasn't. I wasn't just going up there and starting a show all by myself in front of people that had no context of who I was other than some yeah. guy with a guitar and a microphone. Right. So yeah, it was fine. And it was like, Hey, John's voice is shot. So I'm going to do a couple here and, and people were into it. Of course, you know, it was fine. But, um, but that's different than like, if I were going to do even just a one set f night, you know, certain one set show somewhere, I would prepare a whole lot differently than, mm. uh, than I, than I would like, I don't necessarily play guitar going into a monkey fist gig to get myself warmed up. It's like, uh, it's, it's not expected. It would only happen if I choose to do yeah. it. Y you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. That, the, the gig we played the other night was back at this, um, it's called the victory club over in Rochester, New Hampshire. It's a private club. Um, uh, most, what's a private club mean? So yeah, we have, we have these around here. I would, uh, maybe you have them there. Um, this is, th th I don't think it's like affiliated with anything larger, but it around here, we have American legions and VFW halls. Do you have those out where you are? Uh, do, you, do you even know what I'm talking about? Uh, no, I know what you're talking about. I, I can't think of VFW halls that are actually active. Yeah. 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 Okay. It, it it's not as it's not a thing like it is in the east. Yeah. Okay. So what it is is it it's you know it is a private club. You have to be a member to uh to to attend, or you have to be signed in by a member. And most of these places, especially when there's a band playing, are pretty liberal about allowing uh, members to sign in. Kind of their maximum number of people. I think the the laws or the charter of these things say that each member can sign in an additional four non-members on any given night. So as long as there's enough members in there to sort of balance it out, it all works out. Okay. The uh, benefit to the members or, or, or the attendees, uh, the allure of a private club uh, are, I, I would guess threefold. Number one, it's your place. You know who you're going to run into there. Generally they are, organized around a theme this place is based if it feels like a, a biker club i think that's what this this victory club is it's you know but there weren't many bikes there so i don't i don't know maybe it started that way and it, it evolved um 
it, you know, some of them are for veterans and some of them are for, you know, different, um, different groups of people that, that just want to yeah. collect. So that's, that's number one. Number two is drinks are super cheap. Like I went up to get, um, uh, uh, two beers and a captain and ginger for the, th you know, the, the three of us in the band. And, uh, it was less than $12. Oh my gosh. Right. They, they do, um, well, two things. One, is it like what we would have like in the Elks Club or the Lions Club? Exactly. That type of thing? So, yes. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not a private club. I'm, you know, a doorman and a, and a, you know, you have to knock in a certain handshake and, you know, that type of stuff. Not that type of private no, club. No. I'm glad you said that. No, this is very, they generally are, if I was going to generalize, they're, you know, more blue collar than what you just described. Right. You know. Got it. Yep. And, and. I, How I often get, do they have music? Once a week, twice a week. It depends on oh. the it depends on the club. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This place has a gorgeous stage. The sound in the room is great. They've got drop ceilings and carpeted floors, so it just sounds so buttery in there. Mm. But the third reason that people love these places is they are places where you can smoke inside, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this didn't used to be as big of a deal twenty years ago, of course, as it is now. Um, yeah. and, and it is a different thing. So that to me, that's the, really the one downside of it is I know that whatever I bring in there, my body, my clothes and my gear are going to reek of smoke when I leave because everybody that's there smokes, you know, it's it. And so, you know, I just, I, I stage it out at home. I know when I unpack my car pay better than a club date. Yep. Yep. They generally do. Um, and they, you know, I just stage the stuff out. I don't put, I don't put my gear back in my studio i let it sort of air out outside i i put mm. clothes straight in the wash and i take a shower when i get home and the next day i feel like i smoked a pack of cigarettes although i've never smoked a pack <laughs> of cigarettes so i can't say that that that's actually true but i feel something very different um but the the clientele is perhaps one of my favorite t groups of people to play for in a very general sense yeah, they might drink a little bit more than most places. Uh, they rarely get rowdy because the rules of these places, they know that they're going to attract people that might have gotten rowdy elsewhere and maybe aren't allowed to go elsewhere. And this might be the last place in the state they're allowed to drink, right? So they the rules are, you know, if you even, if you get rowdy even once, you are banned for life, right? So it's very, very strict. So people never, there's never any fights. There's never, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. And th the people are so laid back. There's no, like nobody's pretentious. Everybody just shows up to have a good time, enjoy the music, enjoy smoking indoors, <laughs> enjoy drinking. So they all, they, they know each other largely. And they, and they largely know each other. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you really feel like you're at a, a, you know, a private event in a sense, but you know, there's a lot of people there and everybody's so nice. When we got there, when I went up to order those three drinks, uh, a, a, one guy who had seen us the last time, he's like, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Last time I had to leave early. I had something with my wife. I, I couldn't hang out, but tonight, um, I can stay all night. And it's like, great. And so I said, well, I'm going to go, you know, get drinks for the band. He's like, do you guys drink free here? I said, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. And he's like, well, you do tonight. And he, he handed me a 20. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you don't have to do that. Like it's, we get, we get paid. It's all good. He's like, nope, it's on me. And, uh, so that's how I knew it was, you know, 11 something. Cause as she started counting change for the 20, she was like, and 12 oh and 13. And then, and then that same guy came up and he's like, oh, by the way, you're just on my tab all night. So don't worry, you know, don't worry <laughs> about this. But that, but like, that's, I, I it, obviously we're always very that's appreciative fun. about that, but it's not atypical of these places. It happens all the time. And, uh, how many people are you playing for? Um, the other night it was probably 50 or 60, but it, it, it has been 150, it, you know, it was the mm -hmm. Saturday after Thanksgiving, which is, it's a weird night, right? You know, people yeah. are like, in and out. but it was it, like the people that were there were into it. It was, a, it was a great night. It was one of the, you know, one of the best monkey fist gigs we've had in a long time. Band played well. Cool. You can hear really well. It, like, like I said, the. You know, the carpet and the drop ceilings, not so great for uh, resisting the uh, odor of smoke, but hey, it makes it sound good. And you're not going to get the odor of smoke out of there, no matter order, uh, you know, of smoke out of there, no matter what you do, because it's just going to be, 
Yeah. <laughs> there are more people smoking. Yeah. But it really is a fun place. And yeah, they have full bands there. They have, um, it's, it's great. I, I, I really like it. it. As crazy as it sounds, you know, it, you, if it you sound crazy at all, well, there's a way to describe it that makes it sound awful. It's like, Oh, it's a smoky room. You got to play until 1130. You, you know, it's like you, you, I could describe it in a way that made everybody not like it, but, uh, but it's it's great. We had a blast. It's and really nice people. Like that's I've I, I've always liked playing for like biker bars. We played when I was in Texas, man. We played for some of the worst, like like no, notoriously worst biker, you know, groups. The Banditos. We wound up playing gigs at their bars all the time, and they were so so great to play for. Uh, you wouldn't want to cross them, I would. I would presume, based on their reputation, but <laughs> um, but they were great. Like really, that's cool. Yeah, I, I mean, they're there to have fun, and and you're delivering what they want. I mean, I think if you went in there and played polkas when they wanted blues rock or something, you'd that, hear about it. Yeah, yeah, it might be like a Blues Brothers kind of thing, but uh, but you know, we were playing blues rock, like we were playing, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and ZZ Top and. And everybody's happy. That's what they wanted. Like, like mm. deliver the product that you sold to them and it's all going to be good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. think about fling for a second. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day of the gigs that fling gets of the gigs that of the gigs that fling could get. Mm -hmm. Let's put a number on it. How, what percentage of gigs are gigs where, where people want you Versus what percentage of gigs, venues, gigs are that it, it's, it's, a, it, it's people who have built a relationship with that place. I, I mean, I, I'm saying this awkwardly, but my point yeah, is, I know, I know how it, it's like, how much, how much uh, I, I was reading a, a thread about, uh, I'm trying to get my band into this club and this, this guy ghosted me. And all these kind of feedbacks about, yeah, well, screw him, or, you know, all these types of things. But I was just, I was thinking about, one of the comments was, remember, a guy who owns a bar, he's probably getting called by 200 bands. And uh, and it's probably not his favorite thing to do. And, you know, it's not, a, and I was thinking about, like, what, how much of the cover band sphere is, is gigs are gigs get pulled out of inventory because there's existing, you know, there's, there's so much competition and basically it's a relationship. It's, yeah. there's no meritocracy to this at all. Oh, I, I think that's a hundred percent true. I mean, fling is an, a, a strictly original band right now, which is, you know, different than what fling was when we started the show. Uh, yeah. Which uh, you know at the time it was mostly covers and we would throw our originals in so and we were playing you know the the, the types of places that you're describing and uh, and at that point it and 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 for any other band that's still playing covers in clubs right now that's exactly it I, you know the the idea of a meritocracy I suppose it's true up to a very low bar right like if you're just terrible then you probably won't get gigs but as long as you can like play music that sounds like a band is playing music and you can manage your volume in the room such that you're not being overly offensive a hundred percent of the time and you can manage yourself in the room so that volume accepted you're not overly offensive all the time like it, but i but i i this bar is very low. And once you hit that bar, the meritocracy ends, right? It's, it's all about who is m more friendly with the person in charge of deciding who's in the room every night. And I suppose if there is anything, any shred of meritocracy left, it's all about how many drinks did you sell for me lately? Right. Yeah. Like that, that, that's, that's the merit that you're being, that's judged. the merit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that just kind of holding that up to the light. It's like for any, for, from, for any, that's what you would call a public gig. Yeah. And I'm even thinking about like these concert series or these festivals, right? They, they, those gigs are gotten by people aggressively going and getting them, not by some more often than not, not, by some committee saying, all right, let's listen to a bunch of 
tapes and and you know or or, or vi- watch some videos together and let's let's figure out who's the best man for us. Overwhelmingly, it's about the aggressiveness of the gig getter that is shaping, you know, the gig landscape. Uh, you agree with that? I I think that's that's abundantly true. Yeah, but there was a time. 25 years ago and longer, right? Where that was not the case. Right. Like, like right. it was like th- th- this thing that you describe where th- there's this room of people that, that are, or you just one person listening to all the demos that came in and, and deciding what band to book and, and all of that stuff that, um, I'm getting a weird echo, uh, but, um, yeah, that, that happened for sure. It doesn't happen as much anymore. If right. And even, even the places where that supposedly happens, it's still polluted by, Oh, I got a buddy who has a band, you know, let's, let's give him one of the five slots or something. Right. More often than not, it's contacts and it's, and it's just the aggressiveness of the, the gig getter that, you know, is, is determining things. It's just the amount of people who you just put it out there or send in a, send in a tape or a, you know, a, a link or something like that. And that's what leads to gigs. That's, that's a pretty seldom thing for public gigs. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't think it exists anymore at all. Like I, 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 I haven't run into it. I, it, I'd be curious feedback at gig podcast.com. Have, has anybody out there run into a scenario where there's, uh, you know, club calls you based on your, uh, yeah, yeah. Your reputation or your, your demo tape. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think that ha- that happens anymore at, at all. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, do you, you don't, no. do you, you don't see it out there either. Right. House Rockers gets, get some calls. I mean, again, we have like but longevity have and it, yeah. we have a name. Yeah. So we kind of earned that and we do get, but I still, I still make a lot of calls, you know, make sure I don't, I don't, I, I, I have never, been one to just say, all right, done enough work. Let's just wait and see what comes in. I'm, I, you know, someone more aggressive will sneak in and take that gig away from me every single time if it's a public gig. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. when I go to rebook people, you know, I, I have a process that is fairly well regimented. You know, hey, you know, I'm I'm doing rebooks now. You have first shot of it. You know, let's let's and at least have an ongoing conversation. I can't book you now. We're not doing it until January, whatever that might be. But at least, you know, the wheels are turning towards a booking and a commitment. But if I was to just to say, all right, we're done. Next year, I'm going to just see what comes in. That'd be scary as heck. Well, you'd probably still get some just from people who know some. your name. Right. But but I some I, not as many. I, I, I think the real litmus test would be take your house rockers demo. And I realize it would be impossible to do this because people would recognize you. But send it out under a different name. Right. And yeah. see who, how many times does your phone ring? My, my guess is if you just sent it out and said, Hey, we're a great band. You know, we have a combined, what, 250 years of experience of playing. Like, you know, you got a lot of people in your band. Right. So, uh, and every, every you know, we we're professionals, we can deliver. We've been playing the, the, the private party and wedding circuit for the last 10 years. We are well-polished. Now we want to get into clubs here's what we're going to do. And here's our thing. Listen to us. And you know, you can see us with our masks on. This is a great Halloween party. We just played and you, you put your masks on or whatever and you know, send it to people. I, I don't, I, I, I'd be surprised if you got a lot of gigs from that. I, I think it's all yeah, the sales so. game and the relationship game. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't know. I played with a fun little device, Paul. It's uh, it's called the Audigo, A U D I G O. It's, it's this little I've seen it advertised. It's cool. It's a tiny little box, but that's not all that it is. It's, it's a microphone that really with the app on your phone and they all sort of pair together, it becomes this portable recording studio for lack of a, a better term. Although that might be the right term, this little box that has the, the microphones in it. It's a stereo microphone is, I, you know, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think. It, it looks like a, a, sm, like a, a medium sized square of chocolate, like a, like a cube of chocolate. You know, it's, it's it like, it could fit in the palm of your hand and unlike chocolate, it won't melt. Right. But it's, it's this little thing. You pair it up with your phone. It connects via Wi-Fi, 
so that you have a good solid bandwidth. You know, you're not relying on Bluetooth or anything. And then you run their app and the, uh, the device, the, the microphones in this thing are great. They can take high sound pressure levels so that you, you know, you're not like deaf, you know, you're not getting distortion or and all that. Yeah. 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 And it does a stereo recording because it's paired with your phone. You can, record video that then is married to the audio that came from this thing. So your phone records the video, this records the audio and, and like they must be doing some magic in there to make sure it's in sync. Right. Cause the thing is going to be potentially a different distance from the, the, you know, there, there, there could be sync issues and, and there aren't. So my guess is it's using the audio that the phone's hearing to sync it up. And then you, mm. you only hear the, um, you know, the audio that the, this Audigo picks up. But what's really cool is what the app lets you do because once you've recorded something even, and you can put up to four of these things connected to the same phone and, and truly multi-track this. So you've got four stereo microphones, but even with just one, which is how I've tested it, you get to mix where the center point of your recording is. I, I did some recording just out on my patio I had an acoustic guitar and was singing. My daughter was also singing and it was like, oh, th this thing was picking up too much of me and not enough, too much guitar and not enough of, of her voice. And I, I just, you know, p pan is the wrong word. It's really, truly setting the center point of it. And once I did that, it was like, oh, now it's perfectly in balance. You can uh, dial in how wide you want the track to sound, how much of the stereo separation you want to hear or not hear. You can add reverb. You can do some compression, of course, some EQ, and really dial things in. I, I have a, uh, a, a quick little recording. I won't play my daughter because I don't have her permission, but I have me. So, oh, oh that's, the, uh, that's the, the theme song to the show. I don't know if you remember that, Paul. <laughs> let me, let me, uh, I've heard it before. Yeah, let me see if I can get this rolling here. So that's me clumping along on guitar. So like that's just the, like, the, the, there's no separate mic on my voice versus the guitar. This thing was sitting on a table two feet from me. It comes in Wait, nice. The, re the reverb on your voice is, is that affected? It's the an app? effect. Yep. And um, can you uh, save the individual tracks as, as separate files and yes. send, them to a, send them to a DAW? I can absolutely do that. I can get the video track separate. I can get the audio track separate, pull them into a DAW, do whatever I want with it. But that was all mixed right on the thing. And I think if I, uh, I, I hit pause, let me see if I can find where I, I might have my daughter singing along with me. Let's see. I don't know if she's singing here. I know you think you're the queen of no. the underground. Oh yeah, she's singing a unison with me in the other ear. And it, you know, like I'm able to mix it and blend it and like that reverb sounds good. That sounds like I'm singing into a, into a microphone, which of course I am, but it's, you know, it was three feet from my voice, two feet from the guitar. I, so I have a, I have a, I have a tech gab question for you, right? Yeah. Are, it's 219 wire, bucks, by the way, before we get into the, 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 the tech gab, I just wanted people to know. So, yeah. Yeah. My tech gab question is. Is wireless essentially no degradation of quality to wired? And I asked this question. This is the left turn we're going to take. I got a cool, um, I got a cool um, turntable, and I'm trying to decide what to do, you know, to connect it to. And I have some wireless speakers, and I'm wondering if the quality of the of the of what's coming off the turntable if it goes out into the air before the, the speakers grab it, how much, how much quality loss am I having? So it really depends on a lot of things, but the, the first question I'll ask is, is it Wi-Fi or is it Bluetooth? Because the bandwidth of Bluetooth is basically only enough for, uh, I think about 500 K per second. And it might be a little less than that. Um, Whereas the bandwidth of Wi-Fi is much, much, much higher, right? So you could right. you can send lossless audio 
of any kind that we know of over Wi-Fi without issue. You cannot send any kind of lossless audio over Bluetooth, if that helps sort of explain. So, got it. Yeah, so a Wi-Fi connection is as good as a wire for, for digitally mastered music. For, can for, for be di- as good as a wire. It, it depends, yes, unless the devices that are sending it have decided to affect the music with some compression, like, like digital compression, not, not, not dynamic compression. Uh, yeah. it, you know, unless, unless there's a decision made in the engineering of it that says, yes, we know we're going to use Wi-Fi, but we want there to be, you know, very low latency or something. So we're going to, uh, we're going to compress it anyway, even though from a bandwidth standpoint, we don't have to. Right. And so it really depends on, the actual, like the, the specific tech involved, but, but so yes. What is that? What are the data rates you're recording off of this auto go? What, you, what quality of, of file are you, are you ending up with? Uh, it's 24 bit 48 K. So uh, I mean, pl- like as lossless as, as most studio recordings I would ever use. I mean, sur- sure. Some studios might do 96 K, but that, no, no, like it's, it's, you're not going to hear the difference. So, so yes, it's, it, it is lossless to, for this ought to go for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Do, what, what brand of, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to look and see if there's anything else that uh, about this ought to go that we should talk about before we move on. But, um, I don't think so. It's like it, the, it's, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with this thing. Cause it's just so simple. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated by the, the, quality of a microphone at that price point. So it seems like there's high-end studio microphones and then there's similar quality in a very wide range of microphones below that, both studio and and live. Like, it's weird to me having a live microphone for a singer that's a $900 microphone. How much different could it be than a SM58 for a live situation? Okay, so there's a wide range between a 58 and a $900 mic. I can definitely tell in a live setting, uh, as both a singer and as an engineer, I can tell the difference between a 58 and a microphone like the, you know, like the Telefunken M80 series or the... uh, That's 200 bucks. Uh, the Telefunken M80 is yeah, is but closer to 300, but but yes, right. Um, and and the like and the Heil PR you know 35 or whatever, really the PR 37. That's a that's a delightful microphone. So I can definitely tell the difference between a 58 and those mics. By the way, another mic that I got to check out recently, we did a Monkey Fist rehearsal, uh, the Sennheiser E945. What yeah. a mic! Like it. It's 189 bucks. It sounds like it felt, I sounded like me through it. If that, it, you know, it, it like I was able to affect it the way I'm used to affecting a mic. Uh, I haven't tested it for off axis rejection. That's one of the things I really like about the, the Heil and the Telefunken versus a sure SM58 is the, the not picking up other things and the gain before feedback. An, a 58 has relatively speaking fairly low gain before feedback uh whereas the the, the Hiles especially and and the Telefunken sure have have you know much higher gain before feedback so on a loud stage it makes a huge difference to go with a mic in that let's say 2 to 300 dollar range and the the Sennheiser E945 might be in that range I, I just haven't messed with that enough but the difference between let's call them three hundred dollar microphones, even though they're not, you know, they're less than that, versus nine hundred dollar mics for a vocalist on stage with a loud rock band, nah, girl, I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think you're going to tell the difference. I, if it's, you know, if it's Celine Dion with an orchestra twenty feet behind her and everything is truly mixed, like, like, oh, when I went and saw Natalie Merchant. Right. Like that was super quiet. In fact, if people had talked during that performance, it would have been distracting. Like, you know, people, this was a seated listening event. And I think I remember 
looking and seeing like it never hit 90 db in that room right it, you know it was 85 db or something but there was a full band on stage they were you know quite a ways back from where natalie was i forget what kind of mic she uses uh we can certainly find out from our friend dave uh who is her monitor engineer and uh, but it was um like maybe they're using something special for her but i don't think they were I think he would have made a big deal out of showing me like, oh, look, this is the, you know, $1,200 mic that, that Natalie's using yeah. or something. You know, I, it, I don't think that was the thing. It was like, oh, yeah, I got a wireless unit on it and it works great. And she sounded, you heard every nuance of her voice in that room. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Even, I mean, look, even in the studio, right? We, uh, d- during our COVID lockdowns was when we learned about warm audio, right? And and they make the clones yeah of those, you know, ribbon mics and high end condenser mics and tube microphones and all those things. And they sound fantastic. I can tell the difference recording my vocals on that warm. What is it? The two fifty one a, I think is, is what I have. I'll, I'll get the, yeah, it's the WA two fifty one. Um, that, uh, I can tell the difference even with my crappy voice, uh, singing into that mic versus singing into, you know, even a, a, a Heil or a Shure SM7B or, or whatever. It's, it's, there's a, there's a warmth to it that that microphone brings a presence. I don't want to say warmth, a presence to it where there's just like a little bit of high end sparkle and some low end resonance that I don't get out of those other mics. And it, I, I can hear the difference with me, which is saying something. Cause I, anything that can make me sound better is good. <laughs> um, but you know that's a what do we pay for the I'm looking at the warm mic yeah that's it so but that's a nine hundred dollar mic so yes I I can tell the difference in my studio here between a three hundred dollar mic and a nine hundred dollar mic I don't I I wouldn't even consider using a tube condenser on stage I, I think that'd be a, d- a disaster waiting to happen and right. and I and again I don't know that you'd notice the difference I mean you're not soloing things you're not you know, uh, yeah, I don't think so. Unless, unless it was an acapella group or something, but there might be a better way to do that. I, I would, you know, it's the right tool for the job. Right. And I, I don't think a $900 mic or a thousand dollar mic on, on stage makes a difference. Most rock bands that are out there touring right now are using, I, I see Telefunkens like the M80 series more than anything else. They're, they're the sort of the, the standard, Cause high there are game. just so many, so many tools for capturing audio and video now, and it, 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 this Audigo is just super interesting to me. Like a really common thing would be to the for streaming, right? So this becomes your input audio source. Can you route it from the app to like? Does your does your phone know that that's the audio source now? And if and can you select that? And if you wanted to stream something, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, or something like that, can you can you do that? Um, I don't think so. This is built for recording, recording. not for streaming. Yeah. I like, but I, I don't see a reason. Well, no, it, because it's recording onto the microphone, and then. Tran- when you finish a recording, it transfers it, it imports it into your phone and, and does all, if you're, if you did video as well, it does all the, the automatic syncing and everything. But yeah, it's got, it's got 32 gigs of storage in it. And that gives you 48, 40 hours of those 48 K wave files. So, you know, uncompressed. Mm. So yeah, yeah, no, it's not built for streaming. It's, it's, you know, it's built to record and it's doing it locally. So you, you, there's no quality loss, no matter what. You know, it's all happening on the device. So here, here's my contribution to Gear Gab. So my kids yeah. gave me these new uh, Ray-Ban Meta glasses. So do you know what those are? I've they're, heard they of look these. Like Wayfarers. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, and they said, "Oh, you can bring them to your gigs." And so it, they they look like Wayfarers. They've got two cameras uh, in each corner uh, of the glasses. It's got speakers, um, and then it's, you know it's got a bunch of electronics that are in the arms of the of the glasses, right? Yeah. And for taking pictures kind of innocuously, it's really cool. You just kind of reach up to the glasses and you press a button and you can take a picture. And that sends to your phone and you can send it to your, your, your wherever you want to send it. Sure. But the using it as a streaming device, so A, needs a good Wi-Fi signal. So 
The first time I tried to do this was not a good Wi-Fi signal. The second time I tried to do this was not a good Wi-Fi signal. And so the quality of, of the stream, it didn't go for very long. It kind of crapped out. But the funny thing was, um, I thought it would be fun for people to experience a live show from my perspective using these glasses, right? <laughs> and the, the I, short amount I've of often time, thought of this too. That, that, like this is your, uh, yeah, yeah. I think my guess is there's a lot of people, you know, listening that are like, yeah, I've always wanted to share with my family what it looks like from my perspective or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I, I'm I'm doing this, and I, I the little bit of time before the Wi-Fi crapped out that people were watching. Like a bunch of people, like I'm getting seasick. Like you don't, you don't realize <laughs> oh, when yeah, you're how, on stage, yeah, how much you move your head, right? Oh yeah, our brains definitely like smooth all that out for for those of us with the eyeballs, yeah. But for everybody else, there's no smoothing happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so as a for a rock band environment, <laughs> unless I'm gonna consciously adapt what I do with this thing, um, I don't know if it's gonna work for me. It might might work when like I'm sitting on a stool doing a doing an acoustic gig. Um, well, what if you put but, like a dummy head next to you and put the glasses on uh, that and then, you know, and then that would be the, the, the like you could turn you and be like, what do you think? And have like a, a shtick. It, it, it'd be like, like doing a duo gig, even if it's just you, right? You just set up the. the or the, or a ventriloquist gig. Yeah, man. Oh, you could add ventriloquism to your solo gigs. This would be amazing. That's it. That's, that's art. That's, that is art. <laughs> Uh, it is. It, ventriloquism is art. Yep. That's cool. Are they like e comfortable to wear? Do you, you don't, do you wear prescription lenses or anything or did you just get like the, you can get prescription. I don't, I okay. don't work, but you can get them with it. I'll tell you what, they're, they're great for taking pictures easily, you know, yeah. a little less conspicuous than holding up a phone, but they're also the speakers in them are really, really good. So it syncs to your phone. It becomes an output source for your phone's audio. So I just play a playlist and, you know, it goes into these things while I'm taking a walk and they sound really, really good. So, huh. you know, if you want one device instead of having your earbuds plus a camera, you know, and you're going to wear sunglasses anyway. Yeah. So it, it it actually has good utility that way. But like I said, for for streaming a rock show with a guy rocking running around on stage, <laughs> probably not the best experience for people. Yeah. You, you know, you might put a warning signal up that people should take nausea medicine before they, yeah, before they watch the like, stream. Yeah, it's like like 10 times worse than trying to watch the Blair Witch project. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I'm just looking here like it's it's about 300 bucks is where it starts. I think there's there's certain frames or whatever that you can pay a little bit more for, but it's it's in that 3 to 350 range. The camera stream or it takes pictures at uh 30, 24 by 40, 32. And the video is 30 frames per second at 1440 by 1920. So you're, you're getting a decent, you know, a decent number of pixels. How, how they look, of course, is really the, the, the trick, like how good are the sensors, yeah. but yeah. Huh? Interesting. All right. Yeah. And it's, oh, it's got, it's got 32 gigs of memory on it. So it can store, they say, uh, 500 photos or about 50 minutes of video. So yep. 500 photos, photos and 50 minutes of video. So, yeah. Yep. Oh, not bad. Cool. If, uh, if only Tom Cruise knew then or what he knows now or, <laughs> or Don Henley, right? It Don, I mean, Tom Cruise was in risky business with the Ray-Bans, but, um, Don Henley was the one who sang about the, uh, the, the, the Wayfarers, wasn't he? Boys of Summer. Yeah. Boys of Summer. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, wow. All right. What else do we have? Anything? I'm good, bro. Yeah. Same, man. This is fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And, uh, we want to hear about your, what, what gear are you using? And what, what are your solo gigs like? And, uh, I gotta write this down. What is, what's the other thing we say? Always be recording. <laughs>